This is the sermon for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, and the second sermon in the From the Waterway series. The Cutter Artful Dodger is still on hard, as we now wait for what I hope will be the last of our mechanical rebuilds for a while. Of course, our extended stay in the New York, New Jersey area has allowed me some wonderful opportunities to catch up with old friends, as well as to do some ministry I might not otherwise have had the privilege to accomplish. Our continued thanks goes out to Reconciliation Ministries Elder Al Daly and his wife Joan for their tireless patience with the two sailors who have invaded their home. The text for this Sunday is taken from John's Gospel, the sixth chapter. Just two brief verses. The first, verse 37. Jesus said, Everything the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. And then verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Thus ends the text. To say that we're living in contentious times in the United States, politically, philosophically, financially, and religiously polarized times, this may in fact be a preposterous understatement. Now, our wholesale polarization may in fact not be as unprecedented as we think. Our national history, as is the case of many nations, is one of philosophical extremes and often opposing ideologies. What is new, I think, is that we live in times where we cannot escape the conflicts. We are reminded of them on a daily basis through media of all kinds. Even if we wanted to, we could not avoid the fact that we are a people very much at odds with one another in all kinds of ways. But it's the disparity, specifically in the Church, that is of greatest interest and concern to me. And truth be told, then only the disparity in certain areas. For example, even though I might wistfully long for the days when the pipe organ was the king of the American worship scene, and the classical choir was the acknowledged voice of Christendom in the Western world, I am the surprise of some of my colleagues, not all that terribly interested in what have come to be known as worship wars. The styles of expression come and go, and the pendulum of cultural taste continues to swing. The issue of worship, and the way in which we do so, is certainly important. But for all the time I've spent thinking about worship and researching its historical forms and writing about the topic, there are, I believe, far deeper issues, far more intrinsically linked to our lives as followers of Christ. And while I'm telling you what I'm not interested in, I also better go on record saying that the issues of church governance and denominational polity, while fascinating to me, and again are topics I've studied rather extensively, are also not what I believe to be anywhere near close to the heart of the matter. Instead, what I'm talking about today is what we consider it means to be a follower of Christ who is in and who is out, so to speak. What I am profoundly concerned with is how we define ourselves as Christians, and even more importantly, how we consider others. We all learn a simple verse from the sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Your Children, Seek first the kingdom of God. And I believe that in seeking first God's kingdom, in learning to understand what that even means, the rest ultimately falls in place. So in chapter 6 of John's Gospel, Jesus has been doing some pretty spectacular things, culminating perhaps in the feeding of a vast number of people with no obvious resources. And now he has people's attention. He's got the ear of the crowd, and he's begun teaching them. 
or maybe, in fact, he's sorting them out. For it seems that right away there's grumbling. Some of Jesus' listeners were upset with his claim that he, Jesus, was the bread of life. They were perhaps even more upset with his claim that he came down from heaven, and that he alone had seen God, particularly since some of them knew him as the son of Joseph, the carpenter. And as Jesus listens to their grumbling, he responds by saying something extraordinary. In my mind, perhaps the most extraordinary thing of all. From our text this morning, anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. Of all the audacious claims made by Jesus, and we will have to admit, his claims were bold, to say the least. This one, if we think about it, surely ranks among the most outrageous. All who come to him? No one at all rejected? How can this be? He pre-qualifies the claim at the beginning of the verse by saying that all the Father has given him will come to him, and requalifies it in verse 45 by saying that everyone taught by God will come to him. We could spend a great deal of time talking about what that means. Much theology has been drawn up around these verses and the surrounding ones. Some have used verse 37 and surrounding as a proof text for predestination, while others have used it as a proof text for universal salvation. That's often the way it is. The texts, as I have so often said about the parables, tend to read us. They tell us what we think. The purpose of this morning's discussion, I'd like to focus in on what we probably can't dispute in any logical fashion. Jesus says he will never drive away anyone who comes to him, and that those who come to him are taught by his Abba. So if we were to begin to take that literally, it would mean that Jesus will not turn us away because of our race or our sexual orientation. Perhaps even harder to accept, Jesus will not turn us away because of what we have done, the sins we have committed, even the crimes we have perpetrated. Jesus, it seems, from this text, will never drive away anyone, no matter what. And that is truly extraordinary. Now we get back to polarization for a moment. In my mind, nowhere more keenly exemplified in the church. You can't worship with us because you are this. You can't take communion with us because you are that. You can't minister in this church because of some reason of who you are, what you've done, or whom you love. Surely you know what I'm getting at. If not, I'll spell it out. For some, it's divorce that's the deal-breaker. Been divorced? Sorry, you can sit in the back if you want, but don't think you can approach the sacred table. For others, it's sexuality. What's that you say? The person you love more than any other has the identical chromosomal makeup as you. I'm sorry. We may love the sinner. We've got to hate the sin. Once you repent and maybe have some therapy, uh, come back and see us. And by the way, no, you can't be a preacher. Committed a crime, perhaps? Have to register when you move to the community? Yeah. Those doors are always open, but... You know, the food pantry is around the corner. Worship and fellowship, well, that's for us. Of course, it depends on where you are. But trust me, or find out for yourself, there will always be some place to go and feel excluded if you really want. Are you black? Then you already more than likely know about exclusion. Uh, but don't worry, white people. You can find places to be excluded from as well. Are you too poor, too rich, too young, too old, too liberal, too conservative? Don't worry. We've got prejudice and loathing in just your size. And then some would say, But, Pastor, we've got to be obedient. People can't just do whatever they want. 
you're pretty liberal on this whole gay thing, but you of all people ought to know that it says right in Leviticus 20.13 that if a man, you know, does it with another man, they both need to be killed. That's God's word. But I suppose it is. If one is inclined to have a single voice understanding of Scripture, if one really trusts that God somehow dictated his will to people to be written down. But if that's the case, you might want to take note of a few others, not as, well, sexy as the whole gay thing, but in fact far more prevalent in the lives of most good and respectable churchgoers. The same much-quoted book of Moses also prohibits cutting your hair in such a way that the corners of your head look rounded. The scholars, by the way, are still debating what that actually means. But they do get that cutting your beard was really definitely prohibited, as was eating food offered to God after it's been sitting around for three days. And uh, tattoos or piercings, an instant ride right out the door. Extramarital sex of any kind would get you in trouble, particularly if you are a woman. In many cases, it might get you killed. Oh, by the way, eating shellfish of any kind was described in the same negative language as the aforementioned presumed reference to homosexuality. Now, if you take every word of the 66-book canon of the Protestant Church to be the exact word of God, well, it's been a while since I've seen the Westboro Baptist Church marching in New York, holding up signs that God is bringing America to its knees because our soldiers have tattoos or cut their beards. I've yet to see someone come to my office to cry on my shoulder because they found out their bishop eats shrimp. Although, to be sure, there are a few church bodies that adhere to those rules as well, in some cases even making adherence a so-called salvation issue, as in, eat a shrimp, then go to hell. And uh, let's not even get started on pork and bacon. So while we're at it, we might look at some other things in Leviticus that we seem to often miss. Leviticus reminds us to not honor the elderly is detestable. To favor the rich because they are rich, or favor the poor because they are poor, is considered absolutely evil. Telling lies and spreading gossip is mentioned in the same passage as being displeasing to the Lord, as is not leaving extra food for the poor and the wayfarer. But, uh, Pastor, someone might say, Jesus freed us from the need to follow all those rules and regulations, didn't he? Well, that's one way to look at it. Or maybe he just freed us from the ones we don't like. Leviticus 19.33, for example, that instructs God's people not to create troubles for foreigners who come to our nation. Or 19, verse 18, where we are instructed not to take revenge, or even hold grudges. But this morning, as reprehensible as some of these rules may seem to some of us, and as good as others may seem to some of us, the rules are not the issue. I was, of course, tempted to throw out our text about Jesus never driving any away, and a dozen other similar verses, up against the Levitical prohibitions, and suggest that if the Church is so bent on taking what we assume to be the writings of Moses at their exact word, why wouldn't we take Jesus at his? And I suppose for those of you who are literalists, I just did exactly that. But again, the issue is not rules, or even what is authentically inspired by God and what is merely human commentary or attempt to understand. What is significant is that in a world that increasingly cannot get along with itself, where religious people, more than anyone else, argue over what is right and what is wrong, what is permissible, and who can be saved and who cannot, Jesus accepts all who come to him, those whose faith is rock-solid, 
and those who remain doubtful or uncertain, all those taught by God, all those who in the words of 1 John 4.16 live in love, regardless of creed or nationality, race, orientation, or politics. So here's what I would like you to take away from this this morning. If we accept Jesus at his word, that he will never drive away any who come to him, and I pray you will accept this, then we who profess to be his body on earth must also find a way to accept all who come to us, unwilling to lose anyone the Father has sent our way, forsaking our inclination to judge based on the standards that we have set. For this business of judgment that derives from having eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil leads only to death, societal, and even individual. Instead, let us learn of the Father to follow Jesus, to emulate Jesus, even to be the body of Jesus for all who would seek him, even and including those who do not know to call him Jesus, even those who call God by another name. For again, all who live in love are his. And if after all of this, you are still longing for rules to guide you through a polarized, much-divided world, consider this one from Paul's letter to the Galatians, the fifth chapter and 14th verse. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself.